So these three men ceased to answer Job, because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, the son of Bacchal, the Buzite, of the family of Ram, burned with anger. He burned with anger at Job, because he justified himself rather than God. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now Elihu waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, he burned with anger. Now I want you to put on your thinking caps this morning and I want you to use your imagination this morning. So hopefully some of you are good at using your imaginations. I'm going to read you something that is found in a, a very good book by John Stott. Hands up if you know who John Stott is. Yeah? And John Stott wrote a very good book called The Cross of Christ. And in that book, he talks about a playlet called The Long Silence. And I'm going to read it to you. It's very, very worth listening to and pondering. This is not in the Bible, by the way, okay? I just want to make that clear. This is not found in the Bible. At the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light before them. But some groups near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame, but with belligerence. Can God judge us? How can he know about suffering? snapped a pert brunette. She ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror, beatings, torture, death. In another group was a man who lowered his collar. What about this? He demanded, showing an ugly rope burn, lynched for no crime but being black. In another crowd, a pregnant schoolgirl with sullen eyes why should I suffer, she murmured. It wasn't my fault. Far out across the plain, there were hundreds of such groups. Each had a complaint against God for the evil and suffering he permitted in his world. How lucky was God to live in heaven where all was sweetness and light, where there was no weeping or fear, no hungry, hunger or hatred. Why did God know of all that man had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups sent forth their leader, chosen because he had suffered most. A Jew, a black person, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly deformed arthritic, a thalidomide child, and in the centre of the plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. It was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their decision was that God should be sentenced to life on earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At the last, let him see what it means to be terribly alone then let him die. Let him die so that there can be no doubt that he died. Let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced his portion of the sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. And when the last had finished pronouncing, pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word. No one moved. For suddenly all knew that God had already served his sentence. Very powerful 
Like I said, it's not in the Bible, but it makes you think. None of us, whether you're a non-believer here this morning or a believer, none of us can say to God, what right do you have to judge me? You don't know what it's like to be human. You don't know what it's like to be in this world of suffering and pain and mourning. But he does. In the person of Jesus, he knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to weep. He knows what it's like to sweat drops of blood. He knows what it's like to be stuck on an instrument of torture and die and be utterly alone. That's our God in the person of Jesus. And that's what we're finding out from the book of Job. Job, so far, we've seen from chapter 1 and 2. You remember we looked back at that a couple of weeks ago. Job is suffering terribly. His livestock have been killed or taken away. His children have been killed. And he's inflicted with sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And this goes on for months. This isn't over in a week. This goes on for months. We find that out in the book of Job if you keep reading. And Job, he's just thinking, but I'm innocent. I haven't done anything wrong. Is God my enemy? Is God against me? And then along come his three friends. You remember them from last week? And there's a mixed theology in what they're saying. Not all their theology is haywire. But basically, they keep coming back to this. The wicked suffer and the innocent prosper. That's what they keep coming back to time and time again. The innocent prosper, but the wicked, they suffer. And we're going to find out in today's sermon that there's another friend of Job. We didn't meet him last week. The friends from last week, poor theology. There was some truth, but a lot of error mixed in. But this week, we're going to meet someone called Elihu. And he's got something very new to offer us. Now, Elihu, he has four speeches in the book of Job. And each of his speeches is introduced by this formula, okay? It says, Elihu answered and said, or Elihu continued and said. So there's four speeches. It covers six chapters. Now, don't worry, we're not going through all six chapters this week. We're just picking out the key verses. But we're going to learn that we should be listening to what he has to say. Now, Job's friends from last week were, they were much older than Elihu. Elihu's a whippersnapper. He's a young man, but he has lots of really good stuff to say. Now, I do have to say, before we dig in a bit more, that there's two schools of interpretation. A lot of commentators say, Elihu, he's just speaking more rubbish like the other three friends from last week. He's just got more of the same stuff to say. Basically, the wicked suffer and the innocent prosper. But actually, there's another school of interpretation, and this is where I fall in, and other people, that says, no, he's actually got something new to say. He's actually got something to say which is true and right and proper for Job to hear. And we're going to see that this morning. Now, we're going to see it under four headings or four points. Why should we listen to this young man, Elihu? Why should we listen to him this morning? And so we're going to look at this under four headings. So number one, Elihu rebukes Job and his friends. This is really important. Jan read some of this out, but let's read it again. So Job chapter 32, verses 1 to 8. So these three men ceased to answer Job. That's the ones from last week. Can anyone remember their names, by the way? Have a go, even if you get it wrong. Bildad, there you go, there's one of them. Can you remember any of the others? Zzz. So far, can you remember the other one? Yeah, well, well, well done, Roger. Roger was listening last week. Well done, Roger. So here we go. Then Elihu, the son of Barakul, the Buzzite of the family of Ram, burned with anger. Ooh, why is he cross? Why is he angry? He burned with anger at Job because he justified himself rather than God. See that? Very important. He burned with anger at Job because Job justified himself rather than God. Job had a very high view of himself and a very low view of God. And 
Elihu is bent out of shape about that. He's angry at Job. You've not spoken rightly, Job. That's why I'm cross. That's why I'm angry. Verse 3. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. So he's angry with Job and he's angry with his three friends because they had found no answer to Job's suffering. Although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. They were saying, it's because of sin in your life, Job. That's why you're suffering in this way. The reason why you're suffering horribly is because you've got horrible sin in your life. So straight off the bat, he's bent out of shape. He's cross. He's angry at Job and his three friends. You've not got it right, which implies... What I'm about to tell you is something different from what you guys have been saying. I've got something new to tell you, Job. Verse 4. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. So he's like holding back. Oh, hold on, these guys, are, they're older than me. They're, they're supposed to be more wise than me. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, he burned with anger. So... We see here, he's, he's not going to repeat what they've been talking about. He's cross at them. He's angry at them. I didn't like what you said. I, I didn't like what you said, Job. So let me tell you what's happening. I might be young, but I've got wisdom here. In fact, in, I haven't got it up here, I don't think, but in chapter 32, verse 18, Elihu says this. He claims in some way to speak by the spirit or spirit the breath of the Almighty. So it seems to be implying he's speaking by the Spirit of the Almighty, the Spirit of God. He's got something new to teach Job. Let's carry on. And Elihu, the son of Barachiel, the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young in years, and you are aged. Therefore, I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, let day speak. And many years teach wisdom, but it is the spirit in man, oh, there you go, it is up there, the breath of the Almighty that makes him understand. So we're going to hear something very new. Elihu has a category for the innocent suffering. The other friends didn't, but he does. Let's carry on. Here's the second reason why we should listen to him. Elihu is not rebuked by Job. So he rebukes Job and his three friends. He's going to present something new. He's got a category for the innocent suffering, but here's the second reason why we should listen to him. He's not rebuked by Job. Job chapter 33, verses 31 to 32. Pay attention, O Job, says Elihu. Listen to me. Be silent and I will speak. If you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. Now, when Job's other three friends were speaking, Job had a lot to say. He came back at them with arguments and answers. But as soon as Elihu speaks, and he says, if you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. Job has nothing to say. Not until God turns up and he says this. Job chapter 42, verses 5 to 6. God turns up. And Job says this, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. So Job has been saying, I haven't done anything wrong. This suffering doesn't match the wickedness I've committed. But at the end, when God turns up, He's ready to despise himself and repent in dust, in ashes. But he has nothing to say to Elihu. Here's the third reason why we should listen to him. Elihu is not rebuked by God. Really, really important. When God turns up, he has a lot to say to Job and he has a lot to say to his three friends. Let's have a look at this. Job chapter 38 verses 1 to 2. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now he's not talking to Elihu here, he's talking to Job. It's clear from the context. 
So there are some things that Job has said that is not right. He said wrong things about God and about himself. And God turns up and he says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? And he's talking to Job. Let's carry on. Chapter 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you, Eliphaz, you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. That's interesting because he's just, he's basically just rebuked Job, but here he's saying, you've not spoken me of what is right as my servant Job has. That's because this is a complex book. Some things Job said were correct and right, and some things he said he needs to repent of. But you see, God rebuked Job, and he rebukes Eliphaz and his three friends, not a word of rebuke to Elihu. Wow. So this tells us, this should trigger off in our minds that, hold on, what he has taught Job, what's he, what he's going to say over these six chapters is something new and it's something right and something we should take heed and listen to. Here's the third one. Elihu reveals something new. I've sort of touched on this, but what does he show us? If he's not the same as the other three friends who were rebuked and he, he's not the, the same theology as Job, what's he going to be teaching us from these six chapters that doesn't warrant a rebuke from God? the Lord Almighty. And so we're going to look at that. Job chapter 33, verses 8 to 12. Surely you have spoken it in my ears, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, Job, I am pure. See, he's got a very high view of himself, Job. And we're told in the book of Job, yes, he was blameless, he was upright, he feared God, he turned away from evil, but we know from the Bible, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even righteous believers clothed in the righteousness of Christ still sin. And they have in their life, even though they might look better than other Christians and better than other people, they're still deep down pride. They're still deep down lust. They're still deep down covetousness. That word I can't say, covetousness. It's a bit like, when I was at school, we used to do this experiment, we have salty water. I don't know if you ever did this when you are at school. And if you want to extract the salt from the water, you put it on the Bunsen burner. Amazing, they let us play with gas in those days. Did they still use Bunsen burners at school? Wow, I'm surprised that's not health and safety problems there. But yeah, they, they you know, and uh, of course you'd always get that, that stupid you know, child in the class who would mess around with it and the whole place would stink of gas. And the, no one liked their Bunsen burners, there's gas everywhere, you know. But you, you get the salty water and you put it on the Bunsen burner and you heat up the water and it evaporates the water and what's left behind? Salt. And the heat had separated the water from the salt. And that's a bit like our suffering. God uses suffering in our life to turn us away from pride, to extract from us pride or conceit or those hidden sins. But do you know what? The salty water, when you look at that salty water, if you stir in the salt, you can't see it. You can't see the salt. It's invisible. But as soon as you evaporate the water, there it is in the bottom of the beaker. And that's one reason God allows us to suffer. It's not because God is being mean or horrible. If you're a Christian, it's because he loves you and he's separating that sin, pride, whatever it might be, he's separating us, he's cleansing us from it. It's not punishment for sin, it's purification for sin. He's purifying us. It's not punishment, it's purification. But let's carry on. So he says to Job, You've been saying this, Job, I am pure without transgression. I am clean and there is no iniquity in me. Behold, he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He's talking about what Job is thinking about God. You think God is your enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. Behold, in this you are not right, Job. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. So Job, your view of yourself is too high and your view of God is too low. You need another category for suffering here, another category for the innocent suffering. 
Job chapter 33, verses 14 to 20. Elihu's still speaking, and he says this, For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, while they slumber on their beds. For some reason, I find that quite a soothing verse. It just makes me think of being in bed and, you know, in a slumber on my bed. But in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, while they slumber on their beds, then he, God, opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings. Now, no one knows how old the book of Job is, but there's evidence out there that it's really old. Really old, like pre-scripture old. And so we don't know for sure when it was written, but it's most likely it was written, um, the book of Job, the event of Job, I should say, happened um, before there was scripture. Or at least, at least the scripture that we know today. And so God communicated to people through dreams. Today, he communicates to people through scripture. And he could still do it by dreams. He spoke to Joseph through a dream. But that's not the way he normally does it. He does it primarily through scripture. So please, when you go home tonight and have a nightmare or a sweet dream, don't think, what's God saying to me? Please don't do that. Go into the word of God and see what God is saying to you. But here it's saying, God, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men while they slumber on their beds, then God opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings. Why? He terrifies them with warnings that he may turn man aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit his life from perishing by the sword. Man is also rebuked with pain on his bed and with continual strife in his bones, so that his life loathes bread and his appetite the choicest food. So straight away, we see he's got a new category here for the innocent suffering. He's saying God sends these terrifying warnings that he may turn man aside from his deed. Or verse 18, he keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. Man is also rebuked with pain on his bed. So you see what he's saying? He's not saying this is not punishment, but these, these, these warnings are to turn people away from evil, turn the righteous away from wickedness, turn them away from pride, turn them away from their wrong deeds. It's not punishment, it's purifying them. That's what I think is going on. And so Job, this is going on in your life, not because God doesn't love you, he does love you, and he's doing a purifying work in your life. Let's carry on. Whoops. Job chapter 36, verses 6 to 15. He, God, does not keep the wicked alive. Hmm, sounds a little bit what the others were saying, isn't it? that the wicked suffer. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. Now, let's look at that again. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. So he sees contrasting the wicked with the afflicted. And as we carry on, we see the afflicted are actually the righteous, like Job. So there's the wicked, and there's the afflicted, the righteous. So he's contrasting here. Let's read it again. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous. Ah, so the afflicted and the righteous are the same. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he sets them forever and they are exalted. Really? Really? Do the innocent prosper? Are they exalted? Well, let's keep on reading. If you're reading a Bible passage, by the way, and you think, what on earth does that mean? Keep reading. Most of the time, that solves the problem. Look at the context. Keep reading. And if they abound in chains, and he's talking about the righteous here, and if they abound in chains and caught in the floor, uh, cords of affliction, so Elihu has a category here, yeah? the righteous abound in chains and caught in the cords of affliction. 
then he declares to them their work and their transgressions, that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. See what he's saying here? So he's not saying this is punishment again. Again, this is a purifying work here. Particularly that last verse. Look at that, verse 10. He opens their ears, the, the ears of Job, the ears of the righteous, to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. Well, how does he open their ears to instruction? We find this in our lives, don't we? Suffering. When things are going well in life, not many people say, "What you know, <laughs> it's very easy not to learn lessons from the Lord when things are going well. But when things are hard, when there's suffering in our life, it pushes us into the Lord. It pushes us into our Bibles. It pushes us into praying and asking God, please God, help me in this. What, I don't quite understand what's going on here, but I know you're good. And it tests our faith. And it strengthens our faith. Times of suffering in the Christian life, if I can word it like this, are a good thing. God works all things together for the good of those who love him, even suffering. And so that's what God is doing here. And he's saying, this is what's happening in your life, Job. He's opening your ears to instruction and commands that you return from iniquity. This reminds me of C.S. Lewis. And many of you know the Narnia books, brilliant books, but he wrote lots of other books too. Now, don't always get your theology from C.S. Lewis. He wasn't the greatest of theologians. If you want some good theology, go to Jonathan Edwards or, or um, you know, um, I don't know, Martin Luther or Calvin, people like that. Don't get all your theology from C.S. Lewis. Bit dodgy on places, very dodgy. But he did say some very good stuff. And I think he's absolutely right with this quote. This is what he says. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Let me read that again. I think that's gold. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And when we think about it, isn't that what it says elsewhere in the Bible? For the righteous who suffer, we might not exactly know what's happening and why that particular suffering and for how long. But we know one of the reasons God uses suffering is for our good, for our discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Let's move on. Job chapter 36, verses 6 to 15. If they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness. But if they do not listen, they perish by the sword and die without knowledge. The godless in heart cherish anger. So he's talking about the ungodly here, yeah? The godless in heart cherish anger. They do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in youth and their life ends among the cult prostitutes. Imagine putting that verse in a Christmas card. Verse 15, he delivers the afflicted. He's coming back to the afflicted again, the righteous from the context. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. So he keeps coming back to this. The other friends, you're suffering, Job. You're suffering horribly because of horrible sin in your life. Like you know, you've got to have a new category. The innocent, the righteous, the upright can suffer. And he's saying, and God uses it for purification in our lives. It's not because he doesn't love you. He does very much. But it's not because he's your enemy. He's completely for you. 100% for you in Christ. But he will use suffering as discipline to bring holiness in your life, to bring Christ-likeness in your life, to turn you away from evil, 
deep down. And so there's the four points we should listen to him. Elihu rebukes Job and his friends. He's got something new to say. Number two, Elihu is not rebuked by Job. He's got nothing to say. He had lots to say to the other friends, but not Job. Um, Elihu. Elihu is not rebuked by God. Very important. The others were. And number four, Elihu reveals something new to us. And so here's the takeaway. And I've got four things, maybe five. Number one, Job's friends... Some of their theology might have been okay, but a lot of it was dead wrong. You can't look at people's lives and say, you're suffering in that way because of some great evil in your life. Now, the Bible does teach that some people suffer because of sin in their life. It does teach that in places. However, that's not for us to decide. And so when we look at people's lives and their suffering, we can't say it's because of some horrible sin in your life. And that's why you're suffering in that horrible way. We can't say that. And if someone is a Christian, they're a believer, a lover of God, we can't say, oh, it must be something uh, evil in your life. That's why God is punishing you in this way. No, the Bible teaches us if we're children of God, he loves us. And yes, he will discipline us. He will allow difficulties and suffering to come into our life, but he will use it for our good. Number two, Job is wrong. He had far too high a view of his innocence and his righteousness before God. But even the greatest of saints, even a Martin Luther or a John MacArthur or a John Piper or a John Calvin, they're all Johns, aren't they? <laughs> it doesn't matter who they are, there's still sin in there. And it might be invisible to people watching them. You think, actually, wow, well, have they got any sin in their life? But if you knew what went on in their hearts, deep down, that sediment of pride, or whatever it might be. So Job had it wrong. Even the greatest of believers sin. And yet God loves us and he will use difficulties in our life for our good. And here's the third one. And you older generation, we need to listen to the younger kids. Maybe not the really tiny kids, but we need to listen to the younger generations. Now, that's not always the case. You younger people, we should listen to the older people. They've got much wisdom, even if they're not Christians. Your mum and dad might not be a Christian. They've still got lots of life experience. Listen to them. Honour them. Respect them. But that's not always the case. The older generation have much to tell us. The older Christians have much to tell us, and we can learn from them. But sometimes we should learn from the younger generation too. Because... Those three friends of Job, they were dead wrong. But Elihu, he held back, oh, I'm, I'm young. You guys, you're, you're the old ones. You should know what you're talking about. And they were wrong. He said the right thing, even though he was younger in years. And so that would be a kind, gentle little rebuke to you older people out there that sometimes the younger people know their Bibles better than you. Sometimes... They might know things that you don't know, and so you should listen. And here's the fourth one. And we always have to remember this when we look at the Old Testament. It points to Jesus. Job was a blameless man. He was a righteous man. He was an upright man. He feared God. He turned away from evil, but he still had sin in his life. And he suffered greatly. But Jesus, he was perfect. He didn't sin even once. He had no wrong thoughts, not even one. He was perfect. And he suffered on the cross for us, for our sins, to take the anger of God. God was the enemy of Christ on the cross because he bore our sin on the cross. And he absorbed it and took it away for all those who trust in him. And he rose again from the dead. And he's alive today in heaven, and he one day will return. And so if you're not a Christian here this morning, and I know there's non-Christians here this morning, think about this. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered so that you can be at peace with God, so that you can be forgiven for all your sins, and you can enjoy eternity with God forever.